So in this video, we're going to talk a little bit more about the cultural effects of oxycodone and then get into why there is a opioid crisis right now in the United States and also why is there so many people um, overdosing on uh, prescription painkillers right now. And one of the things we need to understand is that a lot of these prescription painkillers actually do not come from petroleum. So remember when we talked about petroleum, most pharmaceuticals, about 80% of pharmaceuticals come from simple um, carbon molecules that are uh, gained from petroleum. But uh, the other 20%, most of those molecules come from nature. And so most pain-killing drugs, Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycontin, Percodan, um, come from, um, do not come from petroleum. So where do they come from? And they actually come from the um, opium poppy, and that's where we're going to get to. So um, in 2009, there's two uh, 202 million prescriptions for painkillers in the United States. It's one of the most prescribed types of medic uh, medications inside the United States, and the U.S. Is, is the largest user of oxycodone in the world. Um, and so we go through more than half of the world's uh, annual consumption of oxycodone. So the United States go, goes through more oxycodone than the rest of the world combined. And, and so it begins to be qu uh, quite a big problem and that the idea of prescription painkillers and the medicine inside the United States are directly tied together, which is part of the problem uh, that has created the uh, opioid crisis as we see it right now. So the actual industrial synthesis of oxycodone actually starts from a different type of opioid that is con uh, obtained from the opium poppy called Thebane, and it is converted into oxycodone in two steps in the uh, industry. But uh, that's why oxycodone is called semi-synthetic. So it means that it starts with a molecule that is obtained from nature, and then they run these uh, synthetic reactions on them. So it is only semi-synthetic. And the idea is Thebane is also gained from the opium poppies. So it is no big surprise to me that you know, oxycodone is um, highly addictive and provides, you know, uh, m many of the problems that we've seen with the other molecules that come from uh, the opium poppy. So where are all the poppies? And this, uh, you know, is kind of an interesting question that you will not see these large fields of poppies that are growing the uh, Thebane that is used to make painkillers inside the United States. There, um, the United States actually exclusively gets its opium gum uh, that they process into Thebane and then into oxycodone from other countries. And so this is an actual picture of uh, opium fields. And yeah, they're guarded with people with machine guns. But currently, India and Turkey uh, grow most of our opium gum, about 80% of our requirement. So these poppy fields that are used to gain Thebane and then turn into oxycodone are actually being grown in India and Turkey. And so, um, and this is kind of an interesting idea just on the side that uh, um, that bees can actually get sort of certain molecules from the uh, flowers that they uh, pollinate and that it is, it's a true fact that um, when they make honey, if they do po um, try to pollinate opium poppies or even say, um, marijuana flowers that they can transfer some of these uh, narcotic substances into into their honey. Um, so this is kind of an interesting question. Why don't we just grow our own poppies? Why do we let India and Turkey grow them and then we pay for them to import it into us? And so this was just an idea that we had. So this is just U.S. policy. It's about 50 years old. And the idea is um, we wanted to limit the number of countries that were actually uh, producing the uh, the opium itself, and the idea is that this has really left us relying on uh, imports from foreign countries. So this is something that um, you know we may have to reconsider in the near future. That we're sending out a lot of money to these foreign countries to grow opium poppies for us when they could um, easily be grown inside of the United States. So if you look, the uh, um, state flower of California is a poppy. So poppies grow just fine inside of the United States, and we just decided as policy to not do this in, uh, in the U.S. So um, the idea is a lot of money is going out, and this could be used uh, uh, for American farmers, could be growing them and making a lot of pot, uh, money themselves. And they actually started doing this up in uh, Canada, where the Canadian, uh, Canadian government has allowed uh, 
farmers to grow crops of um, poppies to produce thebane inside of there, and they're actually making uh, three to five times more per acre than the other crops that they've been making. So this is an idea that maybe um, maybe we should think about doing the, allowing farmers in the U.S. to do this here. Um, so thebane, um, the idea um, the idea is, you know. Uh, when they were developing painkillers, they had heroin and morphine, and they wanted to come up with a painkiller that was um, less addicting but still had the pain killing effects. And this is um, where the idea of oxycodone came from. So they lit on thebane and they tried to make derivatives of the thebane, and they were making um, changes to it to try to come up with uh, a molecule that w worked a little bit better. So it does work a little bit better, but there still is an addictive property to oxycodone. So when you look at it, when you look at the difference between oxycodone and heroin, there is still quite a bit of similarities in there. So they have made some changes in there, but um, the, the structures are so similar that you're still going to get the addictive effects. You're still going to get the euphoric effects that you get from most um, opioids, even if uh, with all the structural changes. You get the same things with oxycodone in comparison to heroin, so it's still going to be a problem. that They have not been able to get rid of the euphoric uh, addictive effects that opioids have inside of oxycodone. So it's a, um, a, a very problematic drug. So the opioid drug crisis actually started with the fact that um, doctors started prescribing opioids quite a bit. And the idea is when they realized that this was a problem, about um, five million Americans admitted that they were using uh, opioids recreationally. So the people were getting them um, prescribed to them and then it became kind of a street drug in itself. And this is where the problems really started. So about in 2007, about 12,000 opioid related overdose uh, deaths uh, occurred and this is more than all the other legal drugs combined. So if you take all the deaths from cocaine and alcohol and you know all these other drugs combined, more people died from an opioid-based um, substance than all the other ones combined. And so this is kind of what drives it home to me that opioid painkiller overdose is now the second leading, leading cause of unintentional death inside of the United States. The number one is a car wreck. So you're more likely to die of an opioid painkiller than just about any other unintentional death inside of the United States. So this really drives home the problem that we're having with the opioid drug crisis. So why do doctors still prescribe opioid painkillers when they understand that they're so addictive? And the reason why there is nothing else that really works. So we have like aspirin and acetaminophen, and that works very good for like kind of surface, achy, you know, muscular kind of pain. But opioids are the only thing that works for kind of a deeper pain. So if they do an operation on you where they cut you open, uh, you know, acetaminophen is not going to cut it. So they still use, use opioid-based painkillers because literally they have nothing else to do. So I always joke, if you want to become a billionaire, find in a molecule that will provide the same level of painkilling effects and not uh, be opioid based and you will make a billion dollars. And so they have tried and when they have tried it has always uh, resulted in, in a disaster. So one of the first ones was Vioxx that came out in uh, 1999. It was used as a treatment for arthritis and acute pain. Um, the problem was in about 2004 they figured out that uh, Vioxx was causing an increased risk of heart attacks and stroke and to the point that you know, uh, between almost about a hundred, more than a hundred thousand uh, Vioxx users had heart attacks, and most of uh, about a third, thirty to forty percent of them was, were fatal. So this drug was causing way more problems than it was solving. So the FDA actually ended up uh, pulling the, the drug. So they they did come up with something that was working as an alternate to an opioid, but it, it started killing people, and so they stopped. Another one that came out fairly recently uh, was 2016. A Portuguese pharmaceutical company uh, had come up with a painkiller that was based on uh, cannabis, the cannabinoid structure inside of there. And this molecule didn't get past the first phase of human drug trials. 
um, that I, I think what what happened was um, when they gave it, they gave it to twelve people and one of them died and five other ones were hospitalized. So this is what's been happening when uh, pharmaceutical companies try to come up with alternates to um, opioid-based painkillers. They have not had good success at all, and although they're still trying, but literally they have no other choice. So yeah, the opium poppy, when you think about it, all these molecules, thebane, oxycodone, heroin, morphine, uh, they all come from the opium poppy, and so it's no surprise that all these molecules are highly addictive and provide a significant problem. So to me, this doesn't really answer the question of why so many people are overdosing. So we understand why um, so many people are addicted to uh, prescription painkillers. So that started with uh, doctors prescribing them and then the prescriptions kind of went wild. And so now a lot of people were taking prescription painkillers. But you know, in recent years, the amount of overdosing that has occurred that has been attributed to uh, prescription painkillers has shot up uh, quite a bit. and. To me, it does not directly relate to uh, these prescription painkillers, and what it does have to relate to is fentanyl. So I, you know, I'm going to talk about uh, fentanyl, and it's just the idea here is where I started investigating fentanyl. It started when uh, Prince uh, died, and this happened f uh, fairly recently in about 2016. And I remember hearing that he had overdosed, and in case you don't know, that he was just this uh, incredibly talented musician that was really popular uh, kind of in the late, uh, the 80s and the uh, early 90s. And uh, he uh, overdosed at 57 years uh, in about 2016. And I remember seeing that uh, he had overdosed of fentanyl, and I remember hearing that fentanyl keeps coming up. And so I wanted to investigate, you know, why is fentanyl starting to show up inside of things? And it's just a really interesting topic when you look at um, famous people and drug addictions. So it has actually been proven that famous people are more likely to uh, be addicted to uh, various substances and they're actually more likely to overdose on these specific substances. So there, there's kind of this special relationship between famous people and drug addiction, which is something that we've always kind of known, but they've actually formally proven this. And so with Prince, what happened was um, he was known for giving these really a um, animated uh, stage shows. And uh, during one of the shows, he hurt his hip and he started taking these prescription painkillers to help that. And the idea was is he wanted to keep this level of, you know, uh, energy inside of his shows. So he started taking more and more painkillers and eventually became addicted to them. And this is the idea that you know wealthy people and famous people can kind of get around a lot of the problems that uh, uh, regular citizens have is that they can you know they have the money to go to multiple doctors. The doctors are willing to bend rules so that they can say this uh, famous person is one of their uh, clients. So they're able to get around it. Also, the um, they're able to buy out if, in case they get into trouble uh, with the law. They're, they have the money to hire lawyers to keep themselves out of jail. Um, and then what uh, what has been happening, uh, what had started happening is after doctors figured out that they were over-prescribing painkillers, they actually started cutting back on uh, people's ability to get painkillers through prescriptions. And what happened was is people who were addicted to these painkillers started buying them from the street. So the idea was they thought that they were going and buying uh, prescription medications on the street, but in, in reality, they weren't. They were actually dry, uh, buying counterfeit uh, drug pills that contained fentanyl. So once again, fentanyl started showing up again. Um, and this is what happened is um, Prince ended up buying uh, adulterated uh, pills. So he thought that they were like oxycodone or something, but in reality, they were pills containing fentanyl that were made to look like oxycodone and then they were sold on the street. So this is the idea is that they completely circumvent the uh, FDA when they go and buy this. The FDA makes sure that when you buy a prescription drug, the drug is 100% pure, that it is what it you know says on the bottle and that the uh, dosage amounts are exactly right. But when you go out on the street and you buy um, drugs, all that's gone. You have no idea what you're buying. You know, have no idea how strong it is. And to me, this is part of the problem of what's leading to these um, accidental overdoses is the, um, the adulteration of 
um, prescription drug pills with fentanyl. So what is fentanyl? Is um, fentanyl is is a molecule. Uh, it's an opioid. It was first synthesized in 1960, and um, it is incredibly powerful. So it's actually 80 times more potent than morphine. And where you typically see fentanyl is um, use. It's used as a, a surgical anesthetic. So you really don't see fentanyl too often outside of the hospital. It's not really commonly prescribed to people as a long-term um, painkilling. Uh, effect. It's just too dangerous, but it works very well, and there's some other factors to it that make it preferred for um, a, a surgical painkiller. So that's where it started uh, being used. Um, and then you say, well, uh, why is fentanyl being used to uh, adulterate uh, prescription painkillers? And the idea is um, the counterfeit, uh, they, they, they use this to be able to create the prescription painkillers, um, and then the the fentanyl is so powerful that if you can get a little bit of fentanyl, you can use that to create a large number of uh, adulterated, say, oxycodone pills because it's so powerful. It only takes a very small amount of fentanyl to uh, create a, the equivalent amount inside of an oxycodone pill. But there's actually another reason, and so to me, this is the reason why so many people are dying from prescription drug overdose, and it's not really the prescription drugs. It's fentanyl. But what's so special about fentanyl? Why is this uh, showing up? And this is the real, to me, the crux of the real story. Um, you know, fentanyl is very dangerous, so this is the idea. Why are people overdosing with it? It's very powerful, and the idea is uh, dosage is um, measured in micrograms. So you can see here, this is about a typical dose of heroin, um, this is a typical dose of fentanyl for about the same potency. So it is very, very difficult to weigh out. And so when you have people selling this uh, on the street, you need to be incredibly precise. Um, and if you even give a little bit too much, it can be fatal. And the idea is we know fentanyl is the problem because when somebody overdoses, the authorities actually go in and look at uh, what they had taken and what the problem was. And then the idea is, uh, starting fairly recently, when they found people who had overdosed, they started seeing that fentanyl was involved, and so there was a large spike with that. And the idea is that you know fentanyl has been used to adulterate um, prescription painkillers uh, artificially. So in 2015, about you know 9,500 uh, drug overdose overdose death. Um, that fentanyl actually uh, represented about that um, fentanyl represents 72% of these, um, which is way more than it previously, previously was. And then this comes down to about 26 deaths per day. So this tells you how, uh, and how uh, big of an epidemic that we have, that roughly uh, 26 people to, per day are overdosing on these, uh, these opioids. So... The idea is uh, fentanyl has become somewhat of a chemical cockroach and that they're, uh, the fentanyl is starting to show up in uh, more places than narcotics. So it makes sense to try to uh, sell it as, say, heroin or sell it as an oxycodone pill, but um, it's starting to show up in other drugs as well. So uh, about 80% uh, of methamphetamine samples had uh, fentanyl in it and about 40% of cocaine samples had fentanyl in it, and in um, roughly 80% of heroin sam samples have uh, been laced with fent fentanyl. So I like to you know, call it a chemical cockroach that is showing up in everything, and this really is the reason why. So you see fentanyl keeps coming up. Why, why are they doing this? Why are they putting fentanyl inside of all these other drugs? Um, you know, it makes sense to try to use it to um, substitute heroin because it's so powerful, but why does it keep showing up? And here you can kind of see um, that in starting in about 2011, this blue line um, uh, represents heroin um, overdoses. So you, um, uh, here, this orange line represents um, overdoses from anything other than a synthetic opioid, and that's remained relatively the same. But what is shot up is overdoses due to heroin, and I believe this is heroin that has been spiked with uh, fentanyl. And then also what is shot up quite drastically is 
the overdoses of synthetic opioids uh, other than methanol inside the United States. So the relative amount of non-synthetic uh, opioids has remained the same, but uh, synthetic opioids is shot up and then heroin is shot up. And I think uh, that part of the reason why overdoses using heroin have shot up is because they've been laced with fentanyl. So what's so special about fentanyl? Uh, the first thing is fully synthetic. So when you look at the synthesis of heroin, heroin has to come from the uh, from morphine from the opium poppy, that this structure is actually so complex that um, you can't make it um, synthetically. You can't make it inside of uh, an industry starting from uh, small carbon molecules that you've got uh, from petroleum. But fentanyl is different that the structure is simple enough that you can actually make it uh, artificially or synthetically. And the problem with it here is this molecule is so simple that people can make it illicitly. So very much like how um, uh, it's very common for people to make methamphetamine inside of illicit drug labs, um, they're able to do the same thing with fentanyl. So you couldn't make heroin uh, uh, illicitly like this, but now you can make fentanyl. You can start with uh, mo uh, molecules that you can gain either by you know, trying to buy them or stealing them, and you can actually cook it up inside of a lab inside of the United States. So the difference here with fentanyl is that you don't have to go through the bother of smuggling in the molecule like you do with heroin. So you have to get, to make heroin, you gotta get morphine from the opium poppy, turn it into heroin and process it, and then try to smuggle the heroin inside of the United States. Whereas fentanyl, uh, it can actually be created uh, inside of a illicit, uh, drug lab inside of the United States, so it's it's able to, you're able to make a lot more of it, and also you don't have to go through the problem of uh, smuggling it. So same thing, fentanyl is just just not complex enough that you can make it artificially. So it makes sense to be able to make it using small molecules and combining those step together, and you can't do that with heroin. And this has been the problem. This is why uh, fentanyl has been showing up more and more often. Um, the real problem is, uh, is that somebody actually created a very simple method, and I believe this was actually uh, completely illicitly done. So I don't think this 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 is the method that is used to make fentanyl that is um, prescribed inside of a doctor. That somebody with a knowledge of organic chemistry actually uh, came up with this method of making fentanyl and then posted it on the internet and then people have been copying it. So the idea is you can start with these very simple molecules and make fentanyl inside of a drug lab and because these steps are actually quite simple somebody with very little knowledge in organic chemistry um, can do this. So you can see uh, you react the ketone with amine to form an imine you then reduce it to kind of do a reductive amination to make an imine and then uh, you react the amine with an acid chloride to form an amid. Very simple. And this has been the problem because it's so simple to make. People can make uh, large amounts of fentanyl illicitly and now they're trying to use fentanyl to, uh, to take the place of other well-known drugs like heroin because fentanyl is so easy to get, they're trying to sell fentanyl as if it's heroin. And this is causing the problem because people think they're buying heroin, really they're getting fentanyl, and then also due to the fact that fentanyl is so potent that it is very easy to uh, add a little bit too much and cause people to overdose. So how, do, how does the FDA know that people are using the Siegfried method? And more importantly, that the fentanyl that's showing up on the street is illicitly made. Um, uh, yeah, there's a, um, there are impurities inside of there that they can test for, but mainly um, they started busting these fentanyl labs. So in 2000, uh, uh, law enforcement agents actually busted five um, illicit fentanyl synthesis laboratories and they understood that they were using this method to make the molecules itself. And you can see they were making it about, when they uh, busted these four labs, they were equipped to produce about uh, roughly 6,000 grams of fentanyl which is able to create about 46 million doses of, of, of fentanyl. So you can see the, the problem uh, being there. So overall, this is really, to me, what is causing the opioid overdose crisis is that uh, on the street, people are selling oxycodone pills 
but they don't contain oxycodone. They actually contain fentanyl, and they're just being made to look like oxycodone pills. And then when people take it, they know how much oxycodone they can take and still you know, survive and not overdose. But with fentanyl, because it's so much stronger and the fact that the people making it, uh, you know, might have made mistakes when they take these fentanyl-laced um, oxycodone pills, uh, they end up overdosing and dying. And then there's also the fact that they're putting fentanyl inside of heroin. And the same thing, people, uh, heroin users tend to understand, you know, the type of heroin that they're getting and about how much heroin they can handle. And so, they're, you know, many of them are pretty good at, uh, not overdosing, but now that they're spiking heroin with fentanyl, it becomes very hard to judge just how much uh, heroin it would take to get somebody high versus uh, killing them. And so they've shown this, that the number of people overdosing on fentanyl is shot up, and this is mainly because people are able to make fentanyl illicitly um, inside of the United States.